What's up guys, welcome back to MVP Learners. Today we're gonna go over every concept you need to know to get a perfect score on the PSAT math section. So what I got on screen here is directly from College Board. This is gonna be the algebra section of the PSAT and includes everything you need to know. So the first thing you need to know is linear equations in one variable. So what this is gonna be is simple equations, like let's say you have three X plus seven equals 10. How would I solve for X? You need to know that. Um, we're not gonna go over how to do it. Today, I just wanna show you what you need to study. So linear equations in two variables. This is um, gonna be your Y equals um, MX plus B slope intercept form. I wish they would use that wording, but that's basically what you need to know. So slope intercept form, um, if you don't know that, go watch a video about that right now. So I'm writing that on screen. You're gonna need to know slope intercept form. So what this will look like is maybe in, I'm going to make an example, you'll have y equals 2x plus 4. Uh, we can graph that and it's going to look something like, like this. So if you don't know how to graph that, please, please learn because that's going to show up a lot on your PSAT. Then we got linear functions. So this is, this will be stuff like f of x equals um, 2x plus 4. So the trick with linear functions is basically, it's very similar to this. These are the same thing, basically. Um, f of x, you can substitute that in for y, and it's basically the same thing. Then we got systems of two linear equations with two variables. So that's when you have like, I'll write it up here, something like y equals, uh, let me move that down a little, y equals 2x plus four. And then you have another equation, y equals 6x minus three. And then you could graph them and so it'll look something like that and basically you have to find the point that they meet at so this point right here that's the system that's the solution to a system of equations so if you don't know how to do that please look into that because that's going to show up a lot as well and then we got linear inequalities in one or two variables so um, basically, we've been solving equations and graphing equations. You also need to know how to solve and graph inequalities. So if you have something like negative 5x minus 3 is less than 100, would you know how to solve that? So that's basically the algebra part. Let's get into the next section. So the next section is going to be advanced math. So the main key takeaways I want you to get from this is we're dealing with nonlinear equations in one variable and systems of equations in two variables and nonlinear functions. So that's very vague. So what do they mean? Well, they kind of tell us up here, we're going to deal with absolute value, quadratic, exponential, and polynomial, rational, radical, and other nonlinear functions. So I'm going to just break down each one. And if you know these, you pretty much know what to do. So the first one is going to be absolute value. So this will be something like this. They have these bars outside. And basically what this means is it can't be negative. So it's going to form this V looking thing because the value of an absolute value function can never be negative. So that's why at zero, it goes back up again. So that's the first one. Quadratics, that's going to be something like x squared so that's um it's gonna form this shape known as a parabola it looks like a u um if you don't know about that i would look into it it's very important and then we got exponential functions so this will be maybe something like e to the x so this will look like an, a very sharp curve upwards like that um exponential functions they get very huge with time that's what you got to know with that a polynomial function, this could look something like f of x equals x minus 3 times x plus 2 times x minus 4. So it's um it's going to be a third degree polynomial. We know this from how many different factors there are. And what we basically gather from this is it will touch the x-axis at 3, negative 2, and 4. And then it'll just go through those points. It looks something like that. Uh, maybe not the best drawing, but I think you get the picture. And then rational functions, This, these are things like f of x equals one over x. And when you graph them, they look like this. And the whole key thing with these is that they never touch zero because the denominator of a fraction can never be zero. So that's what you gotta know with that. This is called a asymptote. And then 
we got radical functions. So these are something like f of x equals square root of x. And when you graph it, it will look something like this. And similar to the absolute value, it cannot be negative. So notice how this, the x values are never negative here. And the answer is always positive. So there, are, these are some of the important functions to know. Honestly, I would put heavy emphasis into quadratics out of all of these. This is where most of the questions are. So these quadratic graphs and quadratic formula, factoring, um, did I forget anything? Vertex form, that's another one, axis of symmetry. Everything I just listed, go and study that. That's, that's where a lot of the advanced math questions are gonna be. So the third section is called the problem solving and data analysis section. But really, this is just, I would just call this the stats section based on what they tell us they're gonna ask. So the first thing they're gonna ask is ratios, rates, proportional relationships, and units. So what you really gotta know about this is like, what is a ratio? So if I write like something like two to three, like what is that? If I have like a proportion equation, two over three equals X over six, something like that, you should be able to tell me how to find X. And then units, I mean, that's pretty easy. I'm not gonna go into that. So that, that that's that. Percentages, one variable data. So a question they love to ask on the SAT is like, let's say something increases by 180%, it increases, so I'll put a little arrow. You'd have to be able to tell me like, what, what, is the, what is the number gonna be after it increases 180%? Or it's, it could be where it's something like it goes from five to 18, and you have to ask, you have to tell me what percentage it increased by. So keep that in mind. Uh, make sure you know how to do that. I will say they try to trick you sometimes because let's say something doubles, right? You might be tempted to say it increased by 200%, but it actually only increases by 100%. So just keep that in mind, okay? The next thing to know is distributions and measures of center and spread. Uh, really, what all this means, um, I'll draw a little arrow. Know what mean, median, mode, and range are, okay? If you know these things, that pretty much covers all that. Mean, median, mode, sh and range, you should have learned this in like elementary school, if I'm being honest, so. I hope I don't have to go into that, but if you, if you are a little rusty on these things, just, just look it up. And then two variable data, da two variable data, can't talk today, models and scatter plots. Um, scatter plots, again, this is something you probably have seen in like elementary school. It's gonna be like, you know, plots with a bunch of, bunch of points on them. And you, you gotta like interpret it and just say what's happening probability and conditional probability um this is just like how do i phrase this these are just questions like okay let's say i have um i have like a pasture of cows a bunch of cows in here um moo, and there's 100 of them and 48 of them are male 52 are female so what's the probability it's male it's gonna be 48. So basically it's just like, you have a sample of something and you just have to interpret like what the probability of that sample means. So that's all that is. Could be like a coin flip. You should also know like, okay, what's my probability of flipping heads three times in a row? That would just be one half times one half times one half is one eighth. So just know, know stuff like that. Pretty simple. Inference from sample statistics and margin of error. So this is where if you've taken practice tests, you've probably seen this. They're gonna ask you a long question about like um, a sample and a margin of error. So all you have to get from this is like, let's say there's a 50% chance within the sample that something happens and there's a 5% margin of error. So like 50% chance and then 5% um, margin or of error, so plus or minus 5% margin of error. Basically, we can say with 95% confidence that it, the result is gonna have between a 5% to 55% chance. So we um, basically, we add five to 50 and we subtract five to 50, and that's what gives us this little range. So that's basically what you need to know with that. 
and then evaluating statistical claims, observational studies, and experiments. Um, honestly, it's gonna work very similar to that last one. They're gonna give you some scenario, and usually it's really easy, I'll be honest. But just go into the practice test and look for those stats questions, and after you do a couple of them, you'll, you'll see the pattern pretty easily. All right, so the last thing you need to know is geometry and trigonometry. So students get into a lot of trouble with this. This is the, probably the most intimidating part on the SAT to some people, but it's actually pretty easy if you know what to study. So the first thing is area and volume. So the main shapes that they like to ask the area for are, I would say, rectangles. So area for that is just gonna be length times width. Um, triangles, so the area for that will always be one half base times height, and then um, circles, and the area for that is always gonna be, it's just gonna be pi r squared, okay? So those are gonna be the main formulas you need to know. Then, uh, oh, volume formulas, um, just know cylinders, this is a common one, so make sure you know that. The, the formula for this is gonna be the base, the area of the base, so like this, times the height, okay? And um, rectangular prisms, so they, they like to ask these sometimes. So say I have a rectangular prism, looks something like this. Um, the volume is just gonna be the length times the width times the height. Or you could write that as big B times H, that also works. So those are the main formulas you're gonna need to know. And if you know these, I'd say, once they ask something weird, you should pretty much have everything you need to know. So then lines, angles, and triangles. We already talked about lines earlier. Angles, um, you know, they might ask something like this. So like they have these two parallel lines and then they um, intersect them. So what you have to know basically is that this angle and this angle are um, the same. They're called vertical angles. And that this angle is, um, this angle down here is supplementary to this one. So they will add up, these two will add up to be 180. So that, that if you know that, that will pretty much cover most of the angle questions they like to ask. And then triangles, um, if we're dealing with angles, just know that they always add up to 180 degrees on the inside. Uh, you probably know that already. And then right triangles and trig. So this is where a lot of students get intimidated. So we have a triangle and then this side is three, this is 54, and then this is X. So a lot of students would get intimidated that wouldn't know how to do this. All you need to know is so ka toa, okay? If you don't know what this is, please look it up. It's how we remember what um, trig functions to use. So this means sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. So for this one, we have the adjacent side to the angle, and we have the hypotenuse, so we're gonna use cosine. I hope that made sense. So we would set this up as cosine 54 equals the adjacent side over the hypotenuse x. So um, this is obviously, I went through this super fast. So again, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments, but that's how you set it up. And then you would just solve it from there and then plug it into your calculator. Uh, make sure your calculator is in degree mode, okay? Or you'll get the wrong answer. But yeah, this isn't a trig crash course. It's just, I just want to show how to do it real quick, but there's more to it. And then circles, um, basically with these, make sure you know the area formula of a circle. Make sure you know the circumference of a circle. So the circumference is gonna be pi times the diameter. Make sure you know that the tangent line to the circle is always gonna be, um, it's gonna be perpendicular to the radius. So make sure you know that. They, they like to ask some weird questions about that sometimes. And make sure you know the equation of a circle. So like um, the equation of a circle is gonna be something like x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals the radius squared, okay? So 
if you've never seen that formula before look it up basically this tells you the center of the circle the y coordinates of the center and this tells you the radius so you square root the radius and the r squared part and that would tell you the radius so that's pretty much it as far as geometry goes it's not too bad if you do everything i show you on screen here you'll be able to get all the geometry questions pretty easily thank you guys for making it all the way to the end of the video make sure to smash that like button down below and subscribe